Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. And in this video, we're going to be discussing the Revelation of St. John, taken from Manly P. Hall's Students' Monthly Letter, April 1938. The Revelation of St. John. Dear friend, it was the wish of Martin Luther that the book of Revelation should be omitted from his translation of the Bible. In his opinion, the apocalypse was of pagan origin and was not a writing of the beloved John. It was filled with hermetic influences and strange allegories which troubled the soul of the great German reformer. Though not greatly learned in comparative religion, Luther sensed the Gnosticism that pervaded the book. He denied the divine inspiration of the entire work, affirming with Erasmus that the apocalypse had no legitimate place in the Christian scripture. He raised his voice against tradition, but tradition was stronger, and after his death, the book of Revelation was restored to the Bible and has remained in its accustomed place ever since. The debate concerning the origin of the book of Revelation began in the second century. Even the gospel according to St. John was involved. Dionysius of Alexandria declared that both books had been written by Serenthes, a Gnostic who, to add credence to his writings, had appended thereto the name of John. Later, St. Jerome attacked the validity of the Apocalypse, leading to the controversy, one of the greatest names in the church. Jerome insisted through some machination of the evil one, the devil had introduced his voice into the scripture itself in an effort to undo the whole labor of Christendom. It must be acknowledged then that the authorship of the revelation is extremely uncertain. The claims of the authorized version that it was the work of John while on the Isles of Patmos may be liberally discounted. It is quite possible that the Serenthus story is the correct one. If so, the revelation may be the most important work in the entire New Testament for the reason that arose from Gnostic scholarship. From a philosophical standpoint, the book of Revelation exhibits a wisdom far in excess of the other Testament writings. Here comparative religion is introduced. The great mystery institutions which dignified the past with their initiates find a place in the apocalypse. The rites of Phrygia, those celebrated the aged one who walks amidst the lamps. The rites of Osiris, wherein is set forth the last judgment. And the rites of the ancient sun god and the horsemen who ride through the sky. All these and many others are to be found set forth in various sections of the apocalypse. Recent translations of Egyptian manuscripts indicate that in some cases the pre-Christian text has been quoted word for word. Here indeed is the mystery of pagan books, with only change of an occasional thought or word, wandering into the Christian scriptures, becoming canonical, and remaining century after century, unidentified as to their original sources. John was one of the disciples who did not suffer martyrdom. He is believed to have been buried at Ephesus, the city of the mysteries, near the tomb of the Virgin Mary. John sleeps through the centuries awaiting the return of his Lord. When that great day comes, he will arise and be seated upon the right hand of his master. These legends have little regard for history, but are products of the traditional trend in early Christian thought. During this period, Fantastic accounts of Christian origins were developed, and these inventions ultimately took on a stature second only to the scriptures themselves. There was a wild confusion of Christian and pagan doctrine. The Greek god Dionysius was canonized, as also was his Roman mode, Bacchus. The pagan mathematician Hypatia, a victim of Christian monks, blossom forth as St. Catherine of Alexandria. It was not until the end of the Dark Ages that anything resembling reason could be clearly distinguished in the picture. This was no time for critical scholarship. From our present perspective, it is reasonably certain that the Apocalypse is a compilation of pagan doctrines with an occasional Christian reference interpolated into the text. Revelation 1-9 reads, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the owl that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
During the years when John is supposed to have lived on the island of Patmos, he was far from the boundaries of Christian influence. The people who dwelled in that region were called Persilianists. The followers of a priestess by the name of Priscilla, she was similar to the Roman Sibyls, practicing strange rites and giving oracles. The Persilianists borrowed from the Gnostics and the Manichaeans and from a wild diffusion of doctrines, concepts, and sorceries that were practiced at Patmos, Ephesus, and Philadelphia. They observed nocturnal rites in grottos and caverns. They believed in a messianic tradition and preserved their mysteries under what were called Phrygian rites. The Phrygian mysteries were celebrated not only near Patmos, but at Ephesus and Philadelphia, two of the seats of the early Christian church. The Phrygian arcana were a curious combination of the messianic tradition of Egypt, part of the Dionysian mysteries of the Greeks, together with elements from the Mithric doctrines of Persia. It was a conglomerate mysticism which grew up and flourished in the most polygot areas of the Near East especially at Ephesus, which was called the melting pot of the ancient world. Ephesus has been referred to as the city of sorcerers. Caravans of traders came there from all parts of the then known world to exhibit their wares. A score of strange religious beliefs and rites mingled and mixed and prospered in the confusion of the community. Devotees worked spells and enchantments. Black magic, necromancy, and divination throve in the congenial atmosphere. The concourse abounded in witches and magicians who sowed indiscriminately love potions and poison. And over this bustling community brewed the sovereign goddess, Diana of the Ephesians. It should not be concluded, however, that Ephesus was without genuine enlightenment in spiritual matters. Here, Buddhist thought mingled with Greek, and the religions of the corners of the earth found common meeting ground. The result was a broader and more tolerant learning than would have been natural in a more secluded area. It was because of this cosmopolitan atmosphere that the apocalypse contained such a wide distribution of ideas. The book could not have been the product of one simple Syrian. It required a broad contact with the beliefs of the time and an acquaintance with many forms and styles of learning. The rites of Phrygia included much of Sabianism or astrology. The initiates worshipped the side real bodies and various celestial phenomena. The ancients had conceived the symbol of a ladder leading upward from the earth to heaven. This is Jacob's ladder and the ladder of Mithras in his Cave of the Nymphs, which is a fragment from the wanderings of Ulysses. Homer describes a sacred cavern of Zarathustra. He says the cave represents this world. There are two great arched doorways, and the ceiling is painted to represent the heavens. Of the two entrances, one is for the descent of the souls, and the other for the return upward of the gods to the celestial state. Revelation 4.1 reads, After this I looked, and beheld, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. This verse must be interpreted according to the doctrines of the ancient pagans. The door which opened in heaven is one of the two gates of the mundane sphere. John ascended a symbolical ladder composed of seven churches, not to be considered literally as religious institutions, but as symbols of the rungs of the ladder of the mysteries. Even Tertullian and Epiphanes acknowledged that there were not the seven churches at the time of St. John. The nature of the ascent into the mystery of divine things is clarified further in the opening words of Revelation 4-2, and immediately I was in the spirit. This can only mean an illumination or internal spiritual mystery by which John was raised up through the door in the mundane sphere into communication with that which abode above the firmament. Having ascended by mystical experience, John is made to describe symbolically that which is above the material heavens. He saw a throne, and upon the throne was a great light. Before the throne were four and twenty elders and seven lamps, and the throne was surrounded with a great sea of glass, like crystal. 
The interpretation is Gnostic. The throne and he who sat upon it represents the lord of the mundane states, Adabaoth, master of the eons. About him are the symbols of the hours which make up time, and before his throne are the lights which are his children. For it is said, from the lord of the eons come forth the princes of the seven planets. The seed-like crystal is the waters which are above the firmament, as described in Genesis 1-7. This superior sea is described by Socrates who declares that there are creatures which dwell about the shores of the air, which are imperceivable to men. This is the Shemayim of the Kabbalah, the side real sea that washes the shores of heaven. This also is the proper sea of life, the waters of life, the heavenly humidity, the ocean of generation from which souls, once immersed in its mysterious essence, fall into the sphere of generation. It is described in detail in the Divine Pymander of Hermes and in the writings of the Neoplatonists. In every great system of mythology, this superior sea is mentioned. It is the same water which is above the firmament, which is supposed to have descended in the flood of Noah. In the mystery of initiation, this sea becomes a labor of purification and as such was symbolized in the rites of the tabernacle by a fountain or basin in the courtyard with its surface inlaid with the mirrors of the women of Israel. The section of the apocalypse which deals with the seven lamps in the midst of which walks the ancient one is pure Sabianism. The seven golden candlesticks are the seven planets and he who walks in the midst of them is the same as the mysterious being who is seated on the throne above the heavens. And the shining figure that rides upon the wheels and the cherubim in the vision of Ezekiel, he wears a golden girdle. His hair is as white as snow, his eyes are as a flame of fire, his feet are like brass, and his voice as the sound of many waters. In his right hand he holds seven stars, and from his mouth comes forth a sharp two-edged sword. Even the wildest imagination could not construe this figure to be an orthodox part of Christian theology. He wears the attributes of the seven powers of God, and according to Revelation 1.20, the star in his hand are the angels of the seven churches. He is garmented in white and like the great figure of the Zohar, moves in a splendor perceivable only to the awakened eye of the seer. And what are the seven churches which are in Asia? They are the seven races, the seven continents, the seven days of creation, the seven sacraments, and the seven mysteries. They are the seven vows which are spoken by the mouth, the seven senses of the perfect man, the seven bodies of the complete man, and the seven principal orifices of the body. The mystery of the seven is the supreme mystery of the one who was, is, and shall be. Adabaoth, lord of the eons, creator of all forms in the mundane sphere ruling like Zeus with a sevenfold scepter of universal law. He is the master of the mysteries, hierophant of the rites of Phrygia, keeper of the seven keys, by which shall be opened the seven doors of the mysteries. The mystery of the seven is completed in the story of the seven seals and the seven churches. The churches constitute a ladder, the lowest rung, which is the symbolic church of Ephesus. Ephesus was ruled over by Diana, a lunar goddess. Therefore, the order ascends from moon to Mercury, the church of Smyrna. Then comes Pergamos, the church of Venus, Thyatira, the sun, Sardis, Mars, Philadelphia, Jupiter, and lastly, Laodicea, Saturn. There are other arrangements assigning the churches differently to the planets, but the result in each case is the same. The churches are rungs of the ladder, which leads upward from the elements to the stars. Astronomically considered, the vision of John assumes unexpected significance. Ascending through the door in heaven, he beholds the constellational diffusion composed of the twelve northern constellations and the twelve southern constellations. 
These were called the Associates or the First Army of the Redeemed. The Northern Constellations were called the Northern Brethren, and the Southern Constellations the Southern Brethren. Each was crowned to represent the fact that it was a radiant star or star group. The ancients considered the area south of the equator as a great ocean from which the constellation arose. The great monster Leviathan creeping out of the southern sea was therefore Cetus, the constellation of the well. This had been related earlier in the story of Jonah. It is interesting to note that the round table of King Arthur contains space for 24 knights seated before panels alternately black and white. At the beginning of the present astronomical age, there was a conjunction of the seven planets in the sign of Eris. This is described in Revelation by the symbol of the Lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. By eyes must always be understood planets or stars, and by horns, the power or ray which emerges. In modern astrology, the sun is exalted in the sign of the ram. Bacchus is pictured in the ancient mosaics with a lamb in his arm, and in the catacombs of Rome, figures believed to be those of Christ carry the lamb in one arm and hold the shepherd's crook in the other. Jesus is referred to as the Good Shepherd. Hermes was the Shepherd of Souls master over the little stars of the constellation of the ram. The sun is essentially dignified in Leo and exalted in Eris. Therefore it is written, the lamb and the lion shall lie down together. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. If you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs>